Okay, so in my effort to keep us moving and on target, um, I am going to uh, exercise the privilege of the chair and make a few remarks before I turn the program over to Leslie um, and our keynote speakers. So, you know, if timing is everything, I have to say the spring of 2012 was a really good time. And I think in this room of fellow travelers, you know what I mean. Um, and, and I have to admit, you may be the only room of people that actually know what I mean. It's true. Um, but we had like the nail biting roller coaster ride of the SOPA PIPA battle. And then we had the Supreme Court decision in the US v. Jones case. And then we had the release of the administration's Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights. I mean, are you salivating yet? Like, this was really, this was like a heady time, right? Um, I know, I'm a nerd, right? I'm a policy nerd. But these are all game changers in their own sense. Uh, but what I want to suggest that each is really a beginning and not an end. And each of them poses more questions than answers. And I thought it would be a good time to reflect upon what some of those questions are and what I think we ought to know are some of the answers. So SOPA and PIPA went down in flames. I mean, honestly, never have I seen members of Congress abandon... <laughs> right. Well, I, I've never seen members of Congress abandon a bill with such speed. It was almost as though like real pirates, the swashbuckling kind, had come on the boat and it was time to jump. Um, and there are many competing narratives, though, right, out there about how and why the tide changed so quickly and dramatically. Some observers hail it as an indication of the potential for the internet to facilitate participatory democracy, right? I'm kind of big on that one. Um, Others call it a revolt or an uprising of the mass of internet users. That's the kind of shirky, you know, the mob you, you choose. Um, some perceive it as the first evidence of the power of online media companies to manipulate their large base of consumers into targeted action, right? Right? Well, and others emphasize the role of advocacy organizations. And I would say there's a growing cadre of, of advocacy organizations. If we look back at the time the DMCA passed, CDT, we didn't have an intellectual property expert on staff. Neither did the ACLU. EFF was in transition. I mean, this is a really different time, right? Um, and so we have this growing cadre of technical experts focused on protecting innovation, freedom of speech against overzealous copyright protection schemes. Others view it as a very simple money story, right? That this is evidence of the tech industry coming of age, resulting in a steep increase in investment in lobbyists. Each of these narratives, right, is an embedded in a very particular idea about the relationship between social movements, technology, and democratic and civic engagement. Um, and what I can tell you right now is that no one knows the answer, right? Everybody's holding onto their piece of the elephant. And I think the question, which is a really important one to ask, no elephant, sorry, a donkey, a donkey, <laughs> I'm sorry. We can be holding on to our whatever, collective elephants and donkeys, but I, I will say that you each only have an ear, okay? Um, and my guess is that everyone in this room believes that some sort of magic happened, right? There were these various institutions and actors and actions, and they somehow coalesced to produce this particularly powerful groundswell of opposition that stopped Congress in its tracks, at least for a little period of time. But why and how and what it means for the future, well, that's a story that's still to be told, and I think one we would really do well to understand, um, certainly if we hope to reproduce it in the future, and to understand what role this vibrant technical infrastructure and the innovation that it supports um, has played in civic engagement, right? Regardless of what cause you're interested in, this is a really interesting political event. Similarly, the U.S. v. Jones case, right, hailed as one of the most important Fourth Amendment cases since Kylo, anyway, um, presents more questions than answers. We have Justice Sotomayor's concurrence asking all the right questions, right? What about this business records doctrine? Now I'm getting really geeky for you. Um, what does this mean for privacy in an age where data lives in clouds or grids on skids? You take your choice. Um, on social networking sites and our devices rather than our diaries hold all of our deepest secrets. I have to say, in, in, opin in an, uh, an opinion that truly could have been written by people in this audience, we would have been really happy to write it, right? Um, she really sets out all of these questions, and then we have 
this wonderful concurrence basically saying, and this is an issue that Congress needs to be looking at because it involves some really sophisticated line drawing that the courts are not so comfortable doing. All of this, you know, seems to kind of set the stage for the sort of work that the Digital Due Process Coalition has been actively pursuing, right? Trying to develop a collective consensus-driven understanding of what privacy requires in a fully networked and digital age. But here, too, we have a whole host of questions about, one, whether or not Congress has the will and perhaps whether the forces that produced a groundswell of opposition in SOPA and PIPA debates can drive a positive reform agenda, right? Because that's what this is. We're pushing a big, heavy boulder up a hill. The courts can be helpful, but I think we all understand where we're headed and the kind of work that we have to do together. Finally, a cornerstone in the administration's Privacy Bill of Rights is the use of this multi-stakeholder process to tailor um, rights and obligations to specific industries. The creation of this venue offers an opportunity for the sustained, sophisticated discussions required to identify and address privacy risks as we enter the age of big data, right? Powered by the Internet of Things, social network sites, and user-generated content. Yet here, too, the questions remain. During the late 90s, we saw a privacy community of activists, advocates, and academics spring up and push forward ideas once given a forum to do so at the Federal Trade Commission, bridging across disparate communities to try to develop innovative, kind of bottom-up, multi-stakeholder solutions. Is this same sort of multi-stakeholder process one that is certainly near and dear to CDT's heart, which was multi-stakeholder before it was cool? Um, right? Is this going to work in this new forum? And, and the legitimacy of this sort of process, right, it can't depend solely on it being open and multi-stakeholder. Right? It also has to depend upon the public policy outcomes of the process. How are we going to think about those? How do we make sure we have the sorts of procedural and substantive legitimacy as we move into this new experiment in how to do internet policy around privacy in this environment? So this year is off to a really exciting start. There's a sense of new beginnings, playing fields opening up, and I think much more room to run. I think if we learned anything from the past successes, everything from Jerry's experiences with ECPA reform, to the CDA, to the SOPA PIPA debates. Internet policy, like the internet itself, is best built in collaboration, through dialogue, where possible, through consensus, and always with an eye on innovation that empowers individuals and in their roles as citizens, innovators, and creators. It's a fabulous year, and I'm really looking forward to spending much of it with the people in this room. So with that, I would like to start off tonight's program features speakers who have pushed the bar forward in terms of innovation in the internet, and it is my sincere pleasure to introduce Leslie Harris, President and CEO of CDT. Um, to most of you, I know Leslie needs absolutely no introduction, but I do want to recognize the fact that under Leslie's leadership, CDT has grown as far as staff, and I think more importantly, in terms of global reach and vision. And with that, I'd like to invite her to the stage. Thank you, Deirdre. And welcome, everybody, to the Tech Prom. I, I'm sorry that we're missing a few of our stalwarts since we weren't able to sort of mesh this conference with IEPP. And the cool kids are still partying at South by Southwest. And yet, again, yeah, I know, cool kids, I see you. <laughs> this is CDT's most successful tech prom yet. Thank you all. I mean, as Deirdre said, this has been a historic year for the internet. And from the Arab Spring to the SOPA internet blackout, the internet really has proved its mettle as a powerful, peerless platform for democracy building and political action. Look how far we've come. This year is also the 15th anniversary of our victory in the, against the Communications Decency Act. 
And many of you, I'm not sure where my friends from the ALA and Freedom to Read Foundation are, but many of you stood up to participate in a case. It changed the internet. It changed our world. And in the wake of that decision, the innovators, the entrepreneurs, boldly stepped into and created a free speech commons that transformed the web into a place for social connection, collaboration, and community. And in turn, that innovation was the engine for the powerful SOPA uprising in defense of the free and open internet. What happened was game-changing. I get it, we don't know what it means, but it was game-changing and it's not going away. Um, I don't see an easy path forward on the issues that drew us to battle, but I do know this. There are many other challenges facing the open internet where today's combatants should be tomorrow's allies. And that's why CDT rate remains committed to an open door, a fairly set table, and an honest dialogue. The past year has been game-changing for CDT as well. A year ago, we launched the campaign for CDT's future to help us realize our vision of a CDT without borders. In the last year, we have been from Cairo to Nairobi, Bangkok to Brussels, where CDT is in full, I'll use the term since it's innovation night, startup mode. And we could not have done this without the generous pledges many of you have made to this campaign. Thank you. We still have far to go to meet our $5 million gold, but the world will not let us wait.